Hi everyone. Okay, creationists don't like the Big Bang Theory and neither do geocentrists. So this should come as no surprise. The Big Bang Fraud. The scientific evidence against the theory by Malcolm Bowden. Okay, Malcolm, before I let you get to the evidence you're going to present, <laughs> let's, um, let's explain the Big Bang model, shall we? Oh, and uh, while you're doing that, I'm going to let you take the 30-second stupid count challenge. This is the proposal that many billions of years ago, a tiny quantity of very dense matter exploded. As it enlarged and cooled, matter eventually condensed out. Then it collected together to form atoms. These formed into stars, and they collected to form massive groups of stars called galaxies. These galaxies then collected together to form superclusters. Wow. Okay, considering how slowly you speak, I did not expect that. Well, this video is not completely redundant, since you're obviously arguing against a straw man version of the Big Bang, but... You know, just for fun, let's keep going. The Big Bang Theory arose from an observation by Professor Hubble. No, it came from Friedman and Lemaitre, who both derived it from Einstein's general theory of relativity. They found mathematically that the universe is expanding and must have started out as a hot, dense, infinitesimal region where this theory breaks down and time effectively stops. Hubble didn't come up with a theory. He made the first empirical observation that confirmed that the universe is expanding. That the further a galaxy was from us, the larger the increase in the wavelength of its light. Exactly. The further away a galaxy is, the faster it recedes and the more redshifted the light from it will be. This is exactly what we would see if space were expanding and we wouldn't see it otherwise. Thus, the whole theory depends upon the redshift being an indicator of a galaxy's distance and its speed away from us. Well, no, not anymore. The Big Bang model also predicts the distribution of matter in the universe, the abundance of light elements, the amount of helium, the expansion of space, which can also be observed using other ways to measure distances, most notably Type 1a supernovae, and most importantly, the cosmic microwave background. The Big Bang Theory not only predicts its existence, but also its properties. Even if cosmological redshift isn't a reliable measure of distance, which we know it is since it's cross-confirmed by observations of Type 1a supernovae, the Big Bang model will still be the leading model of cosmology and in fact the only one worth taking seriously. No other model has any evidence to support it that remotely compares to what I listed here. But. Is this correct? Yes, but I'm sure you'll try to argue otherwise with hilarious results. Halton Arp was investigating quasars which are very bright bodies with very large redshifts. So they must be a very long way away from us. But then he found that many of them had a small wisp of material between them and a galaxy. I can think of four problems with this. The first is that in some cases, this can be an illusion caused by the perspective from which we're viewing the quasar in question. In other cases, it can be attributed to the equipment used to make the observation. In other words, this could all be due to observational errors. The second is that we should expect the odd exception to the rule that objects farther away recede faster. It's just that this will require an object to be moving with sufficient velocity for some other reason than the expansion of space. For example, Andromeda is actually moving toward us, because its velocity in our direction is greater than the effect of the expansion of space between us, which is actually very small since it's so close, cosmologically speaking. Third, ARP's proposal is not that we can't use redshift to measure distances, but that we can't use it as a reliable way to measure the distances to quasars, because they, or so he says, are redshifted due to some intrinsic property that we can't currently explain. What this means is that even if we accept what he says, and we shouldn't, it does nothing to refute the Big Bang model. Finally, ARP's ideas that stem from a time when we still didn't know what quasars were, they're the nuclei of active galaxies, are not supported by more recent observations. 
his findings don't fit in with the results of far more thorough sky surveys, such as the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Want a source? Okay, here's a paper published in the Astrophysical Journal written by Tang and Zhang, who studied the Sloan Digital and 2DF QSO redshift surveys in 2005. I'm linking to the preprint version below. But what actually happened? It was as if a huge button had been pressed around the world to prevent this evidence gaining credibility in conventional science. That's simply not true. He was treated like any other scientist whose work doesn't live up to the standards of the scientific community. The reason he's not taken seriously today isn't that he proposed something controversial. It's that instead of fixing the problems pointed out or acknowledging that he was wrong, he cried conspiracy. This is an example of peer review doing what it's supposed to do. Force scientists to properly support their work so that poorly supported garbage doesn't end up in scientific journals. There are other proofs that falsify the theory. Other than... You know, saying that only makes sense if you have presented something to begin with. If redshift is a measure of distance, then there should be a straight line correlation between these two measurements. In 1976, Tift accurately measured redshifts, and he found that they were in distinct steps of 72 kilometers per second. And more recent studies disagree. Once again, I cite Tang and Zhang's study, I can also cite Hawkins et al, who did a similar study in 2002 and found absolutely no evidence of anything of the kind. But so what? A periodicity in the cosmological redshift doesn't mean that the universe isn't expanding. At most it would mean that our understanding of the mechanism behind the expansion is wrong. As the Big Bang expanded, the disposition of matter should be extremely uniform. But it is not. It is clumped into stars, galaxies, and superclusters of strings of galaxies. Well, that's just silly. Gravity, you fucking retard! Gravity! Have you ever heard of fucking gravity? Gravity! To account for this grouping, they have invented cold, dark matter. No. Dark matter was initially proposed to explain the rotation of galaxies, they rotate as if the majority of the mass is outside the part of the galaxy that we can see, suggesting that galaxies are surrounded by halos of something that has mass but still can't be seen, hence the term dark matter. Incidentally, this also fits perfectly with the observation you mentioned. Galaxies affect each other as if they have more mass than that which can be attributed to visible matter. Dark matter isn't some invention, it's a name given to an observable phenomenon that is still not very well understood. Yet no one has ever seen or measured it. Of course no one's seen it. The clue is in the name. Dark matter. But yes, it has been measured indirectly. Galaxies affect each other and bend light as predicted by the theory. I'd also like to direct you to this image of the bullet cluster, which is actually two clusters in the process of colliding with each other. The collision has caused the dark matter to separate from the ordinary baryonic matter. The blue overlay shows the mass distribution as measured using gravitational lensing, while the pink one shows the X-ray radiation produced by colliding matter. Notice how the blue isn't restricted to very dense regions around the galaxies like you'd expect. Instead, it looks like there's much more mass between the galaxies. Here's a similar one of another cluster. It's really quite simple. Galaxies behave like they have more mass than we can observe directly, and the best explanation for that is... and try to follow the logic here, that they do. In 1992, the Cosmic Background Explorer, COBE, satellite, plotted the temperature of the background radiation. This was gravely announced as the holy grail of science. Source, please. Sure, it's important, but it's no theory of everything. It only found differences of one thirty millionth of a degree. More like a thirty thousandth, as I recall. But anyway, what's your point? And even this was only produced after many corrections and subtractions. And since you don't understand why various corrections are made, you assume it's for dishonest purposes, right? It couldn't be to account for emissions from our own galaxy, now could it? It is far too small to explain the present distribution of matter. Really? Well, what would be required then?
creationists have shown that this low temperature is easiest explained as the energy from the millions of stars warming up the dust in the ether. <laughs> okay, first, source, please. Second, there is no ether. Third, explain how the cosmic microwave background can exist without the universe ever being in the hot, dense state that gave rise to it. Fourth, explain why stars warming up dust particles produce microwave radiation and nothing else. And don't say God did it, I want scientific explanations. Oh, and why do you only look at Kobe? Why not the more recent W map? Oh, right, because it gave better results, never mind. Calculations show that it would take about 6,800 years for it to reach the present temperature. Well, let's see those calculations. What more evidence is needed to demolish once and for all the Big Bang Theory? What more than what? You haven't presented anything yet. But fair enough, I'll tell you. Show me that distant galaxies aren't more redshifted than nearby ones. I don't mean show me the odd exception, I mean show me that the trend doesn't exist. But yeah, it does. Okay, show me that the cosmic microwave background doesn't exist. But yeah. It does. Show me that the universe isn't homogeneous and isotropic. Oh, wait, it is. Any model of cosmology that could ever replace the Big Bang still has to have an expanding universe that started out in an extremely hot, dense state and is still expanding today at an accelerating rate. Those are the facts, and a model that is in conflict with the facts obviously can't explain the facts, thus making it a useless model. What that means is that a model that replaces the currently accepted Big Bang model would simply be a modified version of it. And guess what? The current Big Bang theory is not the one that was proposed initially. It's been modified several times. There's no dogma here. Present evidence and the theory will be modified to take the new evidence into account. To falsify the Big Bang entirely, however, is like falsifying atomic theory. A theory that replaces it still has to explain everything atomic theory does, including atoms. It's not that atomic theory is dogma, it's that atoms exist. If the Big Bang is destroyed, as we hope we have proved, evolution is destroyed with it, for it relies on it to provide the huge time spans for evolution to take place. You haven't even made a serious attempt to disprove anything. You've cited refuted and outdated information, demonstrated that you don't understand the model you're trying to disprove, and you've made assertions that you can't even begin to back up. Also, I think you've missed some very basic mathematics. Let me try to explain this. Infinity is more than 13.8 billion, not less. If evolution has time to happen in 13.8 billion years, it will also have time to happen in a Big Bang-less, static universe of infinite age, which is the alternative you're unwittingly arguing for. If you're trying to say that an invisible wizard magicked the universe into existence 6,000 years ago, then he evidently created it along with a false history, including both Big Bang cosmology and Darwinian evolution, much like a book or a movie can have a backstory that's not part of it, but still remains true within the context of the setting. If God did it, the history we observe to be true is still true within the artificial reality he created. And that's the reality science studies because that's the reality we're stuck in and we live our lives by its rules. No matter how you twist and turn it, as far as science is concerned, God is irrelevant. In this issue was an open letter signed by 34 scientists who complained that criticisms of the Big Bang Theory were consistently blocked. And if you bother reading the letter, you'll see that it's written by people who are either extremely biased and butthurt like ARP, or who simply don't understand the theory. Among other things, they claim that the theory makes no predictions that have been validated by observation, and that's simply not true. I've already given you several examples. They also left out the fact that no other theory makes these predictions. To close, let me quote Sean Carroll's response to this letter. 
If individual researchers would like to pursue a non-Big Bang line, they are welcome to do so. That's what tenure is for, to allow people to work out ideas that others think are a waste of time. But the community is under no obligation to spend its money supporting them. And yes, young people who disbelieve in the Big Bang are unlikely to get invited to speak at major conferences or get permanent jobs at research universities. Likewise astrophysicists who believe in astrology or medical doctors who use leeches to fight cancer. If I get to decide whether to allocate money or jobs to one of the bright graduate students working on some of the many fruitful issues raised by the Big Bang cosmology, or divert it to some crackpot who claims that the Big Bang has no empirical successes, it's an easy choice. Not censorship, just sensible allocation of resources in a finite world.